Welcome to the session. My name is Anusha, and um, with Arnav, we're going to talk about extending Docker using APIs, plugins, and drivers. At Docker, we have this philosophy of batteries included but swappable. What does that mean? Docker offers a versatile and rich set of features that come out of the box. But, and, and this is mainly because we don't want users to have any additional configuration or installation for basic features and subsystems that are necessary for Docker. You don't have to install additional packages. You don't have to install additional binaries. There are defaults available for all the subsystems and APIs that you need to get up and running really fast. However, we also give you the option of extending this experience. And that's what we mean by batteries included, but swappable. Let's take a look at how you can actually extend Docker. In this pyramid, the bottommost section is talking about user-facing APIs. And then going up the pyramid, you have plugins. And then at the top of the pyramid are drivers. On the vertical axis is the amount of effort required to extend Docker using any of these methods. What are the user-facing APIs? Most of you must must have already known about the Docker Engine remote APIs. The effort required to extend the Docker experience using APIs is pretty small. Moving up the pyramid, plugins. Plugins are the natural way to extend Docker subsystems. The effort required to extend Docker using plugins is medium. And finally, at the top of the pyramid are drivers. What are drivers? Drivers are a very overloaded term. In this case, we're talking about execution backend drivers. RunC, for example, for those of you who are familiar, RunC is an execution backend. And the amount of effort required to replace an execution backend driver is pretty high. Throughout this talk, we will go over this theme of what is the effort required, as well as the channels that can be used to achieve them. And with that, I hand it over to Arna to talk about user-facing APIs. Thank you, Anusha. So indeed, I'm, I'm going to start by the bottom of the pyramid, which is the, the easiest way to extend the engine, but not very far from it, the less powerful. There's a lot you can do just by relying on the API. Bottom of the pyramid, where most of the use cases will happen. This is how most of you, regarding, regardless of your use case, may find ways to customize, to tweak, to automate how you use the Docker engine. So as Anusha mentioned already, all interactions with Docker grow through an HTTP JSON API. I'm assuming that most of you already know this, but I think it's, it's worth going over it for a second. So by default, the Docker daemon listens on a Unix socket on disk in var run docker.soc. Whenever you type a Docker comment, so let's take the example of Docker Network LS. Uh, yeah, Docker Network LS. This is going to go over in the network as an HTTP request to the engine. This is going to hit the network API endpoint and return all the information about the current networks. The Docker CLI, as you know it, this tool that you, you use hopefully on a daily basis, it's really nothing more than a very thin wrapper on, a, on an API client library. You can build applications that rely on this API. The client, the Docker client, does absolutely nothing special. It has absolutely nothing privileged, uh, no, no particular access to the daemon. Everything the client does is, is issue HTTP requests to the daemon. So there is a variety of API endpoints that you can use. Um, but first, we're going to look at what kind of interactions we have between the client and the daemon. So this is an example of uh, proxying the, the, the API, so you can see what really goes through on the wire. So on this, dem on, on this example slide, uh, I'm using SOCAT so that I can start a TCP listener on port 8080. 
And on the other, on the other end, I'm going to connect back to the default Docker socket of the daemon. When I do that with the, with the super useful dash V option of socket, I'm going to be able to see everything that goes from one end to the other. And what I can do is using the Docker host environment variable to point my Docker CLI to this local host port 8080. And by doing so, let's say, for example, that I'm going to type Docker version. You can see, thanks to SoCat, that what really goes through on the wire is a Docker client sending a typical HTTP request to the daemon, asking for the version of the Docker engine. You'll notice that it's sending its user agent information. This is actually super useful for the daemon because now we have a variety of possible clients, including Windows clients and Mac clients. And what the daemon will reply is a typical HTTP response, in this case, 200 OK, and a JSON representation of the version information of the Docker engine. So really standard. This is all the CLI is doing, nothing, nothing special. So how can you use this to extend the engine? Well, there's a tons of way I could talk about, and there's a tons of possible endpoints I, we could talk about. I'm going to focus on one, which I think is probably the most important endpoint from the API in terms of capabilities for extension, which is the events endpoint. So what the events endpoint does is that it gives you live external visibility on every action that the daemon is doing. Things like container creation, things like uh, pulling an image, attaching a network, creating a network, all those things, you, they get notified to the events API. And not only they get notified, they get notified live and with context information. So for example, in the case of a container creation, you're going to get the container ID and things like this. So just looking at an example of, of interactions with this API, as most of the API endpoints, there is a corresponding CLI command. Uh, in this case, Docker events. So Docker events is a, is a blocking command. It's, it's never going to return. When you type it, the CLI listens on the API events endpoint and just prints out everything that happens on the daemon. So what happens if you type Docker events in a terminal and, for example, run a very short-lived container on another terminal? So in this case, I'm using Docker run busybox2, typical container that is only going to last for a few milliseconds and exit immediately. What the Docker events CLI will show you is container creation event, container attachment event, network connection, container start, all the individual steps that the daemon went through into creating and, and killing this container. And as I mentioned before, you can see there's a lot of context information. You get the container ID, you get the image it was stored in forum, you get the name of the container, all information that you can consume externally just by observing the engine, and obviously automate by just reacting to those events. So one really, really cool use case that we can look into for this is Interlock. I don't know if some of you may maybe have heard about it. Interlock was developed by uh, Evan Hazlett, who's a, a Docker employee. Um, and it's really an event-driven plugin system. He, he created this tool probably one year, two years ago, back when there were, there were not even plugins in the engine. And, and what this tool does is route events to extensions. So one typical example of extension that Interlock provides is HAProxy. So in a sense, what it does is subscribe to the events API endpoint, look at what's happening on the daemon. When there's a container creation, it can, for example, route to this HAProxy extension to update the configuration. Same thing when a container goes down, update the configuration to remove the container. So really, what Evan built this way is the very first Docker load balancer before we even had load balancer inside the engine. And it didn't require any single line of code change inside the engine. This is, this is purely extending by relying on the API. And even better, because Interlock is built as a Docker container, it's really a drop-in solution. You can, you can run it on your engine. The, the Interlock container will start listening on the API, hook into the events. Whenever it's going to find an event of interest, such as a container creation or a container removal, it's going to route to the proper extension update HA proxy configurations and things like this. So I think that this is a really good example because it shows you that you can add features to the engine without modifications to the engine. This is purely API driven. You can use any programming languages that you like. It's very trivial to implement and yet there's a tons, tons of possibilities. 
Even better than this, uh, I would say that even internally at Docker, this is one of the means that we use the most to prototype things and to try out things before they make it into the engine. One example I can think about is uh, for those of you who have used Docker for Mac. Docker for Mac, when you run a container, you can pass a volume with dash V, and you can even do host mounts, and it works magically. Why it works magically is because Docker for Mac really traps the call to Docker run, grabs the dash V, and is capable of rewriting it to map to, a, to, map to the host and not, and not to, the, to, the, to the Linux VM. So this is typically how you can really like Prototype, f prototype things just by messing around with the API without requiring modification to the engine. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Anusha to talk about a, a maybe more, um, more involved but more natural way of extending the engine with plugins. Thanks, Arna. Plugins. By show of hands, I'd like to know if uh, some people in the audience are already using the plugin infrastructure. Okay, a few hands, good. The level of effort required to extend Docker using plugins is medium. So what are plugins? Some of you might already know, but just to recap, plugins are a process or set of processes that run external to the Docker engine and they extend the functionality of a specific subsystem. Plugins are available for volumes, networks, and authorization plug systems. There is a well-defined interface that is expected to be implemented by the plugin subsystem. So for example, let's take volumes. Volumes manage several things. You can actually create a local volume that, uh, or a distributed volume, depending on what the plugin offers. And the interface typically requires methods for creation, remove uh, of volumes, mount, unmount, getting a list, getting capabilities and whatnot. So that's your well-defined interface as far as the daemon's expectation from the plugin. If you satisfy that interface, then you can call yourself a volume driver. And you can actually extend functionality um, that is not provided by the local volume driver that ships with Docker. The plugin, the plugin feature was introduced in Docker in uh, 1.8. And this is a simple diagram that shows the, that the plugin communication with the Docker engine is using JSON RPC over HTTP. Um, there was a discovery mechanism along with a handshake API. And uh, once the discovery and handshake is established, Docker engine is aware that there is a plugin that serves a specific functionality and is capable of serving containers from then on. And the container has to specify what driver it requires during its creation or runtime, and it can actually use the functionality provided by the plugin system. So what are, how are plugins typically uh, built? They can be a container or they can be a host process. But uh, let's take the container case. We, no matter, whether, no matter whether it's a container or a host process, plugins are sort of unique in the sense that they are a natural extension to the engine. So they need to be just as highly available as the Docker engine because there are containers that are gonna be dependent on them. They also need very powerful distribution channels. If you are a vendor working with Docker, you want just as far-reaching distribution channels as images. And that's key to reach the Docker user base. And you also need predictable runtime behavior for plugins. Plugins typically need more privileges than your standard container process. Um, let's take the volume mounts um, example, volume plugins example again. Um, you might need access to the host file system, maybe creating a specific data directory path, or you might need access to a distributed data storage. So as a plugin author, you need to be able to specify these uh, runtime behaviors in, and, and expect them to be run just as it is uh, by the plugin user. The problem with the original architecture was there were problems with all of these three characteristics that were not fully addressed. 
If you ship a plugin as a container, you had problems with having a deterministic boot order time. You could end up having a container that's using the plugin start way before the plugin itself. As a result, there was a lot of chaos as far as discovering the plugin. There, was, there were no streamlined discovery and distribution channels. There, if you want all Docker users to be aware of your plugins, um, how would you be able to get that message across? Uh, Docker Hub and Docker, the new Docker Store are good mechanisms for discovering plugins, but if, other, if for the lack of it, you would actually have to go to Google and look for the list of volume drivers or network drivers um, that are supported in Docker. Not just that, the distribution channels also have um, issues. Um, vendors end up having their own um, YUM and app repositories, and they have several different packages that have to go for enabling one specific plugin that was causing way too much customer confusion as far as distribution. And lack of uh, specification that defines the plugin behavior was more a pain point from a plugin author standpoint. So we heard this time and again since Docker 1.8, and we fixed it. We have a new plugin infrastructure, and the challenges have been resolved. It's a work in progress, but it's definitely going in the right direction. Let's take a look at the plugin distribution, for example. Plugin distribution will be through the new and shiny Docker store that was announced this morning in the keynote. So your plugins can be hosted on Docker store so that it will reach all of the Docker user database just as quickly and just as easily. The high availability part of the plugin problem is resolved by making sure that the plugins actually start and stop along with the Docker daemon so that you don't have to wait for these dependencies. So your containers know that once the daemon starts, the plugin is available and enabled and can start using the plugin directly. And as far as plugin authors are concerned, we have a new manifest file that can, it's called the plugin manifest, and which is a work in progress, but uh, it defines the runtime behavior of the plugin. So you can define your capabilities, you can define the privileges that are required for the different subsystems that you need access to. All of this is available in Docker 112, which was announced yesterday at the keynote again. It's experimental support, which means that it's not stable yet. Um, the API and the manifest spec are a work in progress, but we highly recommend you to use it, provide feedback, and stay in the loop. And since plugins are now going to be treated as first-class citizens, they have a plugin subcommand, just like containers and images. You can actually manage a plugin lifecycle using the using your favorite CLI, Docker CLI, and API. So, for an example, we built a volume plugin. It's called Tiborvas No Remove. And it's a simple extension of the local volume driver. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the volume driver is expected to implement a specific interface with a bunch of methods like create, remove, mount, unmount, list, etc. We kept everything else but modified the remove implementation. It is something pretty basic. When you actually do a Docker RM-V, you the, the default behavior is to actually just remove the volume. But we just said, hey, we don't want to remove the volume, but just keep a mapping of the volume name to the directory that's on the local host. And if the user ever comes back and creates the same volume again, the data automatically uh, appears. So basically, we don't remove it from the file system, it just appear, uh, we just keep the mapping and use it the next time they use the same name for volume creation. It's just, you. We, we did this just as a prototype, but um, the sky is the limit as far as how you want to extend any plugin. Let's walk through the user experience. This is, as a plugin user, this is your user experience and workflow. 
You, the Docker plugin subcommand actually has an install option that lets you install the plugin from store. There are several things that are going behind the scenes when you look at the plugin install command. Number one, it's actually pulling the plugin from Docker store and computing the privileges of the plugin that are required for the user to actually acknowledge. In this case, we computed that the privilege required for this plugin is access to network host, access to local file system, and a device. Do you want to grant the above permissions? Well, I know Tui Borwas, he's my coworker, so I'm going to say yes. Once I say yes, the plugin is automatically enabled and ready to be used by any containers. When you look at plugin ls, it actually tells you the state of the plugin. The last field says true, which means that it's ready to be used by any container going forward. The other thing it implicitly says is it's auto-enabled to start along with the daemon every time the daemon is restarted. Let's say you don't want that. You can actually disable using plugin disable and you can check the status to see the active column has changed to false. There are a couple of commands that I haven't mentioned here. One is docker plugin set, which is a means to pass options to the plugins. Another command is plugin enable. Again, since everything is auto enabled on install, you don't need it, but there is an option on install where you can actually say install plugin name and no enable, which will start it at a disabled state, in which case you might have to go ahead and enable it later. Uh, so this talks about the plugin user experience, but let's say you, want, you are a plugin developer. What, what do we offer? The plugin system needs to be built and it needs to be pushed to store. The plugin build is a work in progress, and mainly because the manifest file is a work in progress. But in 1.13, that's not going to be true anymore, and it'll be a stable support. So as part of being a plugin author, you will have to define a manifest file. And as a plugin user, you can actually inspect that manifest file to see what this plugin requires. That's a sample inspect output. The inspect is a much bigger um, output, but I'm just focusing on the manifest section. As you can see, the manifest section has a description and a documentation. The documentation can either be your GitHub repo or you can actually just provide user documentation link. The section on interface tells you what, interf what uh, plugin API this plugin is implementing. If you're implementing a volume plugin, then you would mention that it's a docker.volume driver and the version of the API right now is just 1.0. Moving on, the network section actually talks about what kind of privileges are required for, from a networking point of view. Our plugin here just requires the entire host stack. For mounts, you specify the source and the destination path. The source is on your host, and your, the destination is inside the container. So future improvements. We will be having stable support for the new plugin infrastructure in 1.13. And we were talking so far as for, for per node operations. But what about a swarm? Can we deploy plugins across a swarm? Most of, plug, most of the plugins are matter for a distributed system. And we want to make this easier. So in 1.13, we will be addressing this issue by enabling plugin deployment across a swarm. It will rely on the same plugin infrastructure that we talked about under the hood. 
And beyond 113, we are also thinking about customizing orchestrations through plugins. For example, you might want to have a plugin for having a different placement strategy than what comes out of the box, or maybe scheduling modes and such. So sky is the limit as far as what you can do with this plugin infrastructure. And with that, I hand over to Arna to talk about drivers. So drivers. This is, as Anusha said, a very, very overloaded term. Um, in this case, I'm going to talk more specifically about execution backend drivers. So it requires a lot of effort to go this path, down this path. But as you can see, as you will see, you can replace a lot of things of the engine using this mechanism. So first, I'm going to give you a bit of context. I don't know if you are all familiar with OCI. OCI is, um, is a standard, uh, which means Open Container Initiative. It's currently in 1.0 RC1, and it defines an industry standard interface for runtimes. So we, we just talked about plugins. Plugins, they have to conform to a well-defined interface, but they have to conform to a well-defined interface that only exists in the Docker world and that we define and that we offer for people to extend. OCI is very different. OCI, we're talking about something which is under the, the umbrella of the Linux Foundation that has a lot of industry actors. It's really an industry-wide standard that, in, in which many companies and many, many individuals are working to, to define the best interface for an execution runtime. Out of the standard came two major tools. One is called RunC. So RunC is the tool for running containers according to the OCI specification. It's a direct implementation of the OCI specification. It's even more, it's the reference implementation of the OCI specification. It's mostly born from the work of Michael Crosby with libcontainer. Uh, libcontainer used to be the lower level end of the Docker engine. We donated it to the Linux Foundation as a way to bootstrap OCI and, uh, and, and the RunC tool. However, it's not the only thing that we needed to, to, to rely on OCI. There is another tool also created by Michael Crosby. You can tell there's a pattern here um, called ContainerD. So ContainerD is a daemon to control multiple instances of RunC. So let me cl clarify this using a small diagram. So in the beginning, I talked about the user-facing API. This is the green part. We're moving over to the e exact other end of the engine, uh, which I represented here in red, which is the execution bits. So this is the, the architecture design of Docker since Docker 1.11. Something which is pretty mind-blowing since Docker 1.11 is that the Docker daemon alone is incapable of running containers. I'm going to let that sink in, and I'm going to repeat it. Docker 1.11. If you take the Docker daemon, it's incapable of running containers. The only thing it does is sending over request over gRPC to ContainerD. And ContainerD is the tool that is capable of forking RunC processes that themselves will create the containers. Why does it matter in the context of extending the engine? Well, it matters because what you have between, between ContainerD and RunC is the OCI specification. And really, what you have between Docker and ContainerD itself is the OCI specification. So basically, what I'm saying is that behind the Docker daemon, behind the Docker engine, we are relying on an industry-wide standard to run our containers. It's a spec you can read. It's a spec you can implement. You can adopt. You can and be inventive with it. What we, what we did in 112, which is really new, is that we now allow for replacing RENC with something else. RENC is the default that you're going to get. It's the default that everybody's using, really, when you're using the Docker engine on Linux. But you may be doing, you may, you may want to do other things, or you may be running something else in Linux. So this is how it works with 1.12. This is going to be introduced in the, in, in the, in the version in a few weeks. Um, when you run the Docker daemon, you can choose to add more runtimes to it. There's always going to be a platform default runtime. It's, it's always going to be RunC on Linux. But you can add more. So here in this example, I'm running my daemon. For those who don't know, daemon is now called Docker D, not Docker daemon anymore. Um, and you, we are adding a runtime uh, that I'm calling custom, and I'm pointing it to an arbi arbitrary binary on my disk, in this case, slash bin, slash my runtime. Using the API, 
Docker info, I can inspect what runtimes are available on this particular daemon. So I see that in this case there are two, default and custom. And the really cool thing is that I can use a different execution runtime on a per container basis. So there's a default in Docker. When I do Docker run busybox, it's going to use runc on Linux. I can do Docker run dash dash runtime custom, and I can use a wholly different thing than runc to run my container. And actually, I don't even know if it's going to run a container. Maybe the custom runtime is starting a VM. Maybe it's starting a unikernel. Who knows? And this is on a per-container basis. So it means that I can take decisions depending on this. I, I can, for example, take decisions whether my, my image is signed or not. I can, for example, say I'm going to use a different runtime for a signed image that I trust. I'm going to use a different runtime for an image that I don't quite trust that is not signed on the store. I don't know where, where this content is coming from, so I'm, I'm just not going to trust it. And you can even replace the default runtime of the Docker daemon if you want. Uh, so this is Docker D, dash dash default runtime equal custom, meaning that all further operations for running containers without specifying a specific runtime will use my custom runtime. So this is really involved. It takes a lot of effort to write a compliant runtime, but it opens a lot of interesting doors some of them for which we already have use cases, some of which we don't know yet what the community will come up with. I'm going to go over some of the use cases that we already know about. One is the platform-specific runtimes. So yes, RunC is the, is the default on Linux, but RunC is only capable of running Linux containers. There's a team right now in Oracle working on an implementation called RunZ that is capable of running OCI-compliant containers based on Solaris zones. What that means, the, I mean, the, the, the impact is, is pretty, pretty huge. What it means is that you can take the Docker engine as it is today, make it build on a Solaris platform, which is not the hardest part. Now you have a Docker engine on, uh, on Solaris, and if you back it with this RunZ binary instead of RunC, you can do things like Docker and BusyBox, but what's really going to happen is that you're running a Solaris zones. This is, super, this is super amazing. You can replace entirely how the engine runs containers. Other use cases that we know about, Intel is working on a thing called Clear Containers. You may already have heard about it. I think they even have a demo on their booth. Clear Containers is using um, Intel virtualization extensions to run um, very lightweight VMs instead of containers. Similarly, Hyper is working on a thing called RunV, uh, which is also a hypervisor-based runtime. But really, the good thing about this is that it, offer, it offers different uh, trade-offs in terms of performance and security. RunC will be running Linux containers as Docker has always done it. So we know about the trade-off. We know them very well. It's very efficient in terms of performance. It's not perfect in terms of security because you're sharing the kernel with the host. So assuming that, for example, you really don't trust the content that you're running, well, you can use clear containers as a backend or maybe RunV as a backend and have a full-fledged VM being orchestrated by the Docker engine. And the trade-off you get is, well, less performance because obviously there's virtu virtualization involved, but you get the security properties of a VM. You're not sharing anything with the host. That's just examples that we have in mind that exist today. Who knows what the community will invent next? So to sum up a bit what we talked about in this presentation, three ways of extending the engine, three different levels of efforts, Starting with the user-facing API, lots of things you can, you can do with that. Go learn about what the Docker API has to offer. It's, it's fully documented. There's a whole reference on our, on our docs website. See what you can do just by automating and extending by hooking into the API. Trust me, 80% of the use case could be covered by this. Then there's the plugin infrastructure. It's more involved. You have to write a plugin. You have to learn about the, the plugin API that you're interested in, and usually you're going to target something which is more specialized, storage, networking, etc. So try out the new plugin infrastructure that we introduced in Docker 112. It's experimental for a reason. We want feedback. We want real-world use cases. We want to hear how you are using it and how we can improve it before we're making it stable. Try and build your own plugins. Start distributing your own plugins. Um, we really want to foster an ecosystem of plugins, and, and the store will make it extremely easy. Finally, drivers, the level, level of effort is, is significant. Explore how you can implement an execution backend in your favorite platform. 
Um, I talked about Solaris with zones. I'm sure somebody can come up with an implementation for BSD with gels or, or something like this. So thank you very much, and now we'll be happy to take questions if you have any. I think they had mics there. Hello. So there's. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Yes. Um, your, so, um, some extension people uh, already requested some time on uh, Docker is some client side feature. Uh, for example, some adding some feature like Docker Clean or Docker whatever. And for such pull requests, the answer was you can do it with such, such a script combining some existing Docker client commands. Um, do you consider already to have some alias support like Git does so that you can just let, let end user have some very simple command, but without making the API more complex? Want to take it or? <laughs> so the question is about uh, having to not touch the API and still be able to make changes, add Yeah, yeah. so, so I, so I here, uh, as a Git user, for example, if there is some cumbersome command that you use to pass with combining lots of options in Git, you can define an alias to shorten your command. And uh, with Docker, when you want to do some advanced use of the Docker client, uh, you don't have this option. So there is many pull requests of on Docker requesting such features. Um, and that has been just closed because uh, the Docker team considers that you can already do it by combining commands, so they don't want to make Docker more complex with tons of new, feature, of new commands. But yeah. we don't, you can, on the other way, you can't define alias, so. Yeah, I, I think that the, the, re, the response still holds. We have no plans right now on extending and allowing to extend the CLI in terms of comments and creating aliases. There's been discussions about it in the past. It comes up pretty often. Um, last time we talked about it, we did consider on a per project basis the ability to add custom commands. Uh, it's not in the roadmap, really. I don't think it'll happen anytime soon. One word is that we really want to make sure that the, the user experience for all Docker users is consistent. We really want to keep the CLI as possible a thin layer on top of a API client. So it's, it's a dangerous road to go down because we might start creating fragmentation and we might end up in a world where people look into, uh, for example, a blog post of somebody using Docker using comments that don't exist anywhere else. Also, we get several different issues and pull requests to customize for each and every individual user. So just accommodating that as part of the standard API is confusing and also making it a lot more complex than necessary. You mentioned a few times about pushing and pulling plugins from the Docker store. <clears throat> I'm wondering if it's possible also to get plugins from a Docker Hub or more importantly from a private registry or some other thing? So um, as far as private registries are concerned, yes. Um, the only requirement is that you have to implement the newer version of the registry, registry version 2.3. So as, if you have your own local registry running, just make sure that you have a registry version 2.3, and that's the only requirement. I, sh I should also add that. Uh, because it's using all the same distribution mechanism that we have for images, you can do signing of plugins, you can rely on all the tools that you have today that know how to interact with registry store, basically, and, uh, and, and, and do the same thing for plugins. So regarding the uh, plugins that are distributed via the store, are they going to be subject to the same kind of scrutinization that images are regarding uh, security and things like that? So there is a certification process that's a work in progress from the store team. Um, what plugins will eventually end up is sort of similar to images, where you have official plugins that are certified by Docker. Um, and then you can have unofficial plugins as part of your own repo. Typically, the recommendation is if you are serious about reaching the entire user base for Docker, we recommend that you go through the official plugin certification process so that it complies with whatever requirements are necessary for a plugin type and so on. 
Hi. Uh, can, uh, can we have some actions based on uh, events, some API? So for example, I see the event create and I do some, I want to do some validation and then maybe stop that container from being started or I want to uh, add a default volume to some, every time I, uh, I see a container is being running. Uh, so, so some events, uh, actions based on this uh, further events going to happen by looking at the events. So can I stop, for example, a container from being starting after I see that, oh, this is this container, I did some validation, I said, oh, I don't want to uh, let it run now. So I, I think the events endpoint, as it's working right now, is gonna be after the fact. So you're not gonna be able to hook into the events endpoint to change the behavior of the daemon. You can observe and you can automate, but for example, when you get a container start event, the container is already started. What you wanna do, um, you could do possibly through authorization plugins. We have support right now in the engine for it, and you're gonna, you're gonna get the incoming request, and you have a chance to do something about it, including not forwarding it down to the daemon, which essentially is kind of like doing API proxying. Okay, thanks. So uh, what is the level of control that you get with plugins? Does it, like if you were to develop a networking plugin, does it replace the uh, Docker zero and the bridge that is created by Docker and all the packets go through the plugin or you can do it, some inspection and send it back to the driver? Does it, do you know how it works? Sure, so just like how you can create um, networks with a specific driver. Okay. So there is a local driver that comes with a, a Docker. You can actually, once you have a plugin, you can actually specify during runtime of a container, you can actually specify the driver that you want, which is actually the plugin. You can also create networks using the plugin. So as long as it's all, the plugin name is basically the driver name that shows up in Docker Network LS, and you can actually use the driver to run to create your containers, to create your networks and whatnot. So there is a well-defined uh, interface for network plugins as well. Um, similar to volumes, you can actually create, delete, uh, join. Um, there is a whole interface for, the, for, for that. So, as, so once the daemon knows that a container wants to use a specific network driver, the requests are routed to that specific driver rather than the local driver that's shipped with Docker. Okay, so the entire packet flow then has to be driven through that plugin per yes. se, right? Even traffic going out of the host and everything has to go from that plugin at yes. that point. Okay, thanks. There's a talk at the end of the day on, about um, networking deep dive by the, the two main contributors of the networking stack of Docker. Okay. So I'm sure they will mention plugins and I'm sure they'll go over the plugins API. Okay. It's actually in this room. It's a Docker Ops talk. And um, following this is also a talk on volume and storage deep dive. So if you guys are interested, you can stay back. So a question on the, uh, the plugin manifest. Is that achieved with labels, or is that like a flat file that's inside the container? Can you repeat that question? Sorry. Uh, the plugin manifest that you guys described, is that currently um, achieved with labels, or is that from a flat file that's injected into the container? Uh, it's, so the flat file is nothing but a JSON specification that will be shipped and distributed as part of the plugin image. It's a flat file. Okay, it's a flat, oh, all right. Um, was it considered to use labels? That would seem very useful to be able to use the same sort of facilities that are there for inspecting containers without even having downloaded it necessarily. So I've got my labels and that's enough to describe. Is it just because there's so much structured data potentially in the flat file that, well, in the, in the JSON file? Um, but that wasn't considered maybe or not? I just seemed, Using labels? It, it seemed like a good interface that was already there. Labels typically, as far as I can tell, are used more for annotations and can change. They're not immutable, uh, but the JSON specification um, sections are standards. They're not mutable, they're not expected to be changed. Um, and we actually try to follow similar, say, similar um, uh, sections from other specifications that we have within Docker, like maybe the OCI spec, or maybe the image manifest, so that there's commonality as far as people who are actually writing these manifests by hand. Thank you. I think it's gonna be the last question, because uh, we have people coming in for the next session. 
All right, I'll try to be quick. Uh, the new plugins that'll be coming in through the Docker store, are they gonna be kind of like packaged as in a container or will they be on the host? As in, will the plugin be running as like a hidden container or is it gonna be running as a binary on the host? So it's not gonna be a process directly running on the host. Uh, we don't want to use the term container. We wanna call it a plugin because it's, uh, although it's technically behind the scenes implemented as a container, uh, it, it's an abstraction that we want to sort of hide from the, like give, give the user so that they don't think of it as a container and shell into it and try and modify it and shoot themselves in the foot. So we think of it as a plugin, but essentially the background implementation is using containers. Okay. And just Thank one, you. one very quick thing. Something like volume drivers like Flocker, is that considered a plugin or is that not in the plugin ecosystem? The volume driver, if you don't use a local volume driver and you, you extend the API, the volume API, that's considered a plugin, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Round of applause.